It's the summer of 2020. The murder of George Floyd erupted the nation and brought to light the topics of equality, police brutality, and many other debates pertaining to rights for black Americans. It just so happened that trombonists all around the world during this time would also be given the opportunity to discuss racism. For said news pertained to none other than one of the most famous songs ever written for trombone, Lassa's Trombone. <laughs> accessibility and simplicity of the song caused it to become a standard in the world of trombone literature. Numerous different ensemble settings were arranged for it, including jazz band, concert band, trombone quartet, symphony orchestra, and more. If the trombone was going to be featured in any ensemble setting, odds were that it was Lass's trombone. It lived as a staple of trombone music for many generations, but on June 26, 2020, Doug Yale, renowned trombone scholar and owner of his blog, The Last Trombone, published the this article. Trombone players, it's time to bury Henry Fillmore's Lassus trombone. In this article, he revealed that Lassus trombone, among more than a dozen of other compositions written by its author, was, quote, born and marketed in a crucible of racial stereotyping, minstrelsy, racism, and Jim Crow. It all started in 1908 when Henry Filmer wrote Miss Trombone. Something you'll notice is that as you heard in Lass's trombone, you heard something called a glissando, which is simply put. Although not nearly the first, Filmer was one of the many early adapters of the trombone gliss. According to Doug Yeo's blog, it was not long before the trauma and glissando began to be strongly associated with music that was a part of minstrel shows. These were entertainments that featured caricatures of African Americans, with both white performers in blackface and black performers made up to look like white performers in blackface. The shows were mostly presented for the benefit of white audiences, and the caricature of black culture that the shows embodied was a product of white racist thought that saw African Americans as bumbling and unintelligent. Music that reinforced these stereotypes was a part of the Jim Crow era and it proved to be very popular among many whites. Minstrelsy was so popular back then that even Arthur Pryor cashed in on the opportunity with his composition, a coon band contest, to use racial stereotyping as a marketing tool. His publisher of the composition came up with this as its cover featuring this large-lipped conductor as well as other characters who are being depicted as unintelligent. Over a period of 20 years, beginning with Miss Trombone in 1908 and including Lass's Trombone in 1915, Henry Filmer wrote 15 trombone compositions, grouping them all to be known as the Trombone Family. He subtitled each of them using caricatured African American dialect to describe his fictional black family. Each one of these 15 works, mostly Lass's Trombone, stood the test of time being played for generations. When asked about the title of his song, Lass's Trombone, this was Filmer's answer. Why, Molasses, of course, I really don't 
don't know why, except I thought of molasses on bread for breakfast, dinner, and supper. Thing is, in the Jim Crow era, which Fillmore lived right through, molasses was metaphorically used to represent slave plantations because it was one of the many products of slavery in America. Also, Shouten Leaves a Trombone was originally entitled Hallelujah Trombone, but his father, James Henry Fillmore Sr., wasn't a fan of him playing fun of Handel, but he also didn't object to his son stereotyping blacks as evidenced in his racist hymnals. When Fillmore set out to advertise the growing list of the trombone family, this was what it looked like. In the February 1919 edition of the monthly band and orchestra journal, The Musical Messenger, published by Fillmore Music House, this advertisement appears. And in 1918, this ad appeared in the Jacobs Orchestra Monthly. From these two ads alone, it is more than evident that Fillmore is profiting off of racial stereotyping. According to Doug Yeo, this is what we gotta do. 1. Spread the word about the dark history behind Lass's trombone and the trombone family. That means share this video as well as Doug Yeo's articles linked below. 2. Bury Lass's trombone and all other members of the trombone family. Even before the release of Doug's article, Gordon Cherry, owner of Cherry Classics, removed two arrangements of Lass's trombone they were profiting from. With the whole 15 trombone features now out of the question to no longer be ethically performed, one would think that we should start getting creative writing new trombone music with glisses in them, but we actually don't have to do that. Around the time Fillmore wrote his trombone family, another trombonist, likely taking inspiration from Fillmore's idea, conjured up his own trombone family that had zero ties to minstrelsy, African-American stereotyping, or racism. His name was Nathaniel Cleophas Shorty Davis. Nathaniel Cleophas Davis was born in Nashville in 1888 and that wasn't so long after the end of the American Civil War. As we think about musical life for an African-American performer in the late 19th and early 20th century in the South, we have to keep in mind that the Jim Crow era affected everything. Black musicians could perform both for white or black audiences, but never mixed audiences. Minstrel shows and minstrelsy, uh, blackface was a big part of that. Uh, caricatures in vaudeville shows. So we look at the kind of music that Nathaniel Davis was involved in, and he stayed mostly away from the minstrel show genre. He went more towards another area where African-American performers could work, which was in the circus. He played in a number of circus bands, including one he organized himself. And in fact, he played in P.G. Lowry's circus band, which was the first band of all African-Americans to play for sideshows at the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey Circus. He also taught music in his own conservatory of music that he founded with his two brothers and in other schools such as Fisk University. We are aware of a number of different pieces that Davis wrote, but the core of the music that we have are several pieces that he wrote for band. Five of them are written in a particular style that we call trombone jazzes. Now, this has nothing to do with jazz as we know it today. The word jazzes was a word that was used to describe the trombone glissando, the sort of smeary kind of playing that every nine-year-old child that picks up a trombone does the very first thing when it's in his or her hand. It was a big part of ragtime instrumental music and the trombone was at the center of it. We have five pieces by Davis written between 1916 and 1921. And these are all ragtime pieces that use the trombone glissando in a big way. It was a part of that evolutionary process from cakewalk to ragtime to jazz, the trombone was a central element of this.
All five of the band works are in the public domain, which you can download using the link below. And thanks to the recent work of Aaron Hettinger, all five compositions are now available as trombone and piano adaptations, which you can purchase from his website using the link below. So if you're looking for some trombone music in your upcoming recital, Aaron Hettinger has got you covered. Here we have the music of Nathaniel Davis, a composer who lived 100 years ago, who for many, many decades was completely forgotten by musicians and culture at large. What a joy it has been to watch conductors and bands and soloists around the country, even around the world, embrace this music of an African-American trombonist, composer, band leader, World War I Army veteran, publisher, and a man who wrote music for the joy that you or I could gain from it. And here we are, a hundred years after he wrote his five trombone rags, celebrating the life and work of Nathaniel Cleophas Davis. On July 2nd, Wycliffe Gordon, one of the most brilliant jazz trombonists of our time, released a statement titled, Will Things Change This Time? The next day, Doug released another article outlining the fact that racial justice was being served in music, politics, and sports. In just over a week, Doug Yeo's first article went viral. It was read over 64,000 times and was shared all over Facebook as well as being republished on numerous other websites and blogs. He wrote a follow-up article on July 6th, which clarified some points people were complaining about. 1. He does not want to burn and forget Fillmore's The Trombone Family. He wants to bury them so that they can remind future generations of its dark past. 2. He is not calling for a boycott of all of Fillmore's music, only The Trombone Family. 3. Anyone comparing Fillmore's The Trombone Family to how racist Wagner was are talking about two completely separate, albeit similar, issues. 4. Anyone calling Doug Yeo names or labels for revealing this news about Fillmore's trombone family will not change his mind about his decision. 5. While Carl Fisher in future republications of Fillmore's trombone family removed the dialect subtitles, colorizing, and removing the blackface eyes and lips, is an attempt at removing the racist nature of the history of the pieces. It still doesn't change the fact that Fillmore himself intended the original works to stereotype African Americans. And 6. Simply saying, playing Lass's trombone doesn't make me a racist, is unacceptable if you don't consult with people from different perspectives, including African Americans. All voices must be heard.